Hello everybody and welcome to our June webinar series and to start the series we have a presentation today with Marcus Gardner and he will be talking to you about hardware in Scrum and if you have questions for Marcus just please type them into the, the questions field on your control panel and we'll get to them then and the way today's presentation is going to be broken up it'll be looking at different sections and Marcus will take a few questions after each section but he'll tell you a little bit more about that himself so let me hand you over to today's presenter Marcus hello Marcus hi there so I hope you see my screen now so scrum in hardware yes I'm Marcus Gattner from IT Agile in Germany Hamburg and um, on the front slide, you can see the Vicky Speed Shop. I attended a Train the Trainer event uh, with Joe Justice from Vicky Speed in February on Scrum in Harper. And here are some of the essentials I found, and even with some of the clients I'm working with. And um, so let's go for it. So what's the problem? So why would anyone try to apply Scrum to the hardware world? Well, the current marketplace looks like this. So Porsche releases every seven years a new 911 model with overlapping development and a total of 14 years for each model. Boeing has a new 737 model every six years. Microsoft releases a new gaming console every eight years. Honda has a new Civic model every four years, as well with overlapping development for eight years. And Bosch uh, releases a new autonomous car steering rack every, every few weeks. So it seems like hardware vendors, especially in the automotive industry, and as well as for Microsoft with the Xbox in the gaming industry, they are already um, working on uh, iterative development. They just have very long cycles for that. And um, taking into consideration that, well, at least to newest data, in 84 years our planet will become uninhabitable by humans because the primary contributors of that are energy sources of oil and coal. And uh, given the current average of six years iterations in the hardware industry, that means we have 14 iterations until we go extinct. And from the software world, where we started with somewhat longer release cycles with a year or something in the late 80s, early 90s, we managed to get beyond that to learn faster. And in order to overcome that, we'll go extinct as humanity, we um, can help there probably with something like Scrum. And it says in the Scrum Guide that Scrum itself is, well, um, not only applicable to software products and in the software world, but with some adjustments, you can also do the same in uh, the hardware world. So that that's the main problem: faster learning through shorter iterations. Here's a quick look on the agenda. So we have four main sections. We'll start with Scrum outside of IT. Then we'll deal into scaled hardware development. Uh, we, there's a difference between software development and hardware development when it comes to deployment. Deploying a software package is usually just easily achieved by just copying the package over. In the hardware world, we usually have production lines and how do we deal with that? And very much widespread is supplier management in the hardware world as well. I'll take three questions after each of these sections on the section and then We'll continue, maybe we have some spare time in the end to go into a bit more details or other questions that might have come up. So let's start with Scrum outside of a team. So this again is the wiki speech up during the workshop. We had a build party 
we'll be working on uh, the cars. You can see in the front a racing car that Joe is building there or started building in February or was building at the time I was there. In the back there's another model. I think this is the eighth model from his Wiki Speed car. And you can see all the uh, stuff lying around in his garage. <clears throat> so Scrum outside of IT, how, how does that look like? There are a couple of case studies already on how Scrum is used in, um, in the world outside of software development. And he, here's a rather prominent one. So on the left side we see one plane. This is the F-35 developed by Lockheed Martin. According to news details it is uh, $143 billion over budget. So the initial development costs $1.5 trillion but it can't fire its own gun until latest postponement. 2022 for the final systems integration. The one model of the F-35 uh, costed in 2014 273 million dollars and it was raised in 2015 to 337 million. Lockheed Martin itself is a waterfall -a shop and um, I don't know whether that sounds familiar to you but waterfall development uh, is usually laid nine out of ten times in the widest, uh, wider industry. On the other hand, on the right side, you see another plane which is similar to its goals. It's projected to um, fulfill the same um, well missions. It's um, the goals are similar as for the F-35 and the Saab Ripen. On the right side you see the Saab Ripen. It's developed with Scrum and uh, every six months the cumulative um, changes from each of the sprints are integrated into one new release. So there's every six months a new model coming out. Right now it costs 43 million dollars which is 20 percent of the F-35 and uh, received awards from Jane's Aviation Weekly and so on. It is currently available on the market and uh, the final statement on that slide is a statement from a Marine Corps general who said we're presently taking the newest um, <coughs> the newest I can't see my screen here how do you turn this control panel off? We are presently taking the new situation and analyzing whether 2,443 aircrafts is the right number. So this is military speak for the US Navy who ordered 2,443 F-35 and they're currently investigating to cancel their orders which would yield 2,445 aircrafts times 337 million dollars, a couple of trillion in, uh, as a setback to Lockheed Martin, which is one of the largest employees in the United States. So you can imagine that, well, with the F-35 not available until 2022 and the subprime currently available at a lower percentage of the cost than the F-35 and these are um, th these have in tactics similar um, goals. You can buy the one already which is developed with Scrum and you can't buy the other for another seven years. So that's going to get lots of problems. And there are other case studies, other vendors who are currently working with Scrum. I've been involved last year with a company who was building a surgery desk. I hope that's the last time I've seen the surgery desk in person quite near to me. And um, they were 
using Strom in order to, to, to see what are the models we can build here, what are new innovations we can come up with when it comes to production techniques and so on, and also transport that to the other desks they have in their stock, in their production lines already. Uh, there are other things like, um, how is it called? Uh, John Deere is also developing their um, hardware with Scrum, and there are lots of success stories around those efforts. So that sort of concludes some of the uh, case studies, some of the applicable fields where um, Scrum is applied in hardware development. Are there any questions yet? Doesn't look like it. I would like to see a cursor here. It seems to be hard to handle. Oh, no, it works. Uh, I see there's one question in there for you, uh, Marcus, if yeah. you see in your control panel there. Um, yeah, I don't get the point about humanity extinction. There's nuclear energy, solar energy, and wind energy sources. That's sort of right. Um, there are companies working on that. On the other hand, um, coal and oil, like uh, cars, for example, are used not only in the car industry, are not only used in the energy industry, but in the production plants of so many vendors. Um, it's quite well, arguable whether nuclear energy is uh, helping us there. Um, I'm personally from Germany, I said, and um, there are at least two nuclear power plants in Belgium or France, I'm not quite sure, quite near to the border of Germany, quite where I live, which uh, are going through the news these days. And the question that usually pops up during these things is, uh, whether they are secure, I think one or two of them have been shut down for a couple of uh, times in the past weeks or so. So, um, coal and oil is not only used for energy consumption, energy production, but also in industries like cars and so on. and um, it's quite well questionable whether um, the energy industry is the sole output of CO2 gases there. Not in presentation mode? What does that mean? And they're just referring to your slides there, and Marcus, right now yeah, no. we're, we're just seeing the... Yeah, I switched off the presentation mode so I could see my mouse, so I can click on the questions and see what uh, those are. I'll switch back to presentation mode in one. So, flying a non-finished plane is considered secure then, sorry, it doesn't make sense at all. Well, the plane is not unfinished. You can get it and it's fully system integrated every six months for the individual systems you have there, and you can still purchase it already and uh, get it. So it's not unfinished. And it's pretty secure because they're testing it all of the time. With every sprint, at the end of the sprint, they are testing all the different models, how they work together. But we'll get to that. Okay, so let me continue. I'll, say, I'll take three questions. Scaled hardware development, so how does it work? Um, where do I start? So, taking a look at, uh, here's an example that Joe just shared from, from Bosch. So, they set up an APIC together with C-level management, which says, as Bosch, I'd like to market a complete autonomous vehicle solution for existing OEMs to integrate into their established vehicle models so that we can be the majority supplier of the autonomous vehicle renaissance. 
they estimated the value behind that and that's getting a tag price of 180 million dollars once they have that solution in place and they estimated in terms of effort how effortful it would be to produce something like that this is just a number here 987 points for example they have acceptance criteria so there should be vehicle to vehicle learning um, the solution should be able to pass the US driver's test before quarter three in 2017 and there should be no changes to OEM body and weight so that uh, car vendors won't need to be able to um, change the, you could say, their, their architecture. So the body on white in the car industry is um, the plain car where everything else fits on. So that's sort of the, the basic infrastructure you have and it's quite costly to replace that. So how do they use that EPIC there? So they have several EPICs, for example the autonomous vehicle model we just talked about and then there's maybe project B, C, D and so on. They ranked it on the backlog on an EPIC level, assigned a product owner to each of the uh, different EPICs and they have a chief product owner as well for the overall ranking and that product owner becomes in, gets in charge for um, for delivering that EPIC right so once he's pulling that from the backlog to the doing um, what he does is there are acceptance tests and there's a value proposition there and the product owner surely can't work alone on that EPIC he probably needs couple of teams in order to be able to deliver that automatic vehicle solution. So he gets a couple of product owners around that for different targets, for different, uh, for different sub items on the overall EPIC and the product owner of the EPIC and the other product owners together break down the whole structure and um, each of the product owners gets one of the goals necessary to develop the autonomous vehicle model and um, works with a team on its own on that. What they do there is uh, they use something like agile architectures so that they are able to deliver independent models which are easily integrated to keep not only the costs low but also keep the integration costs low because in hardware the integration part is usually the hardest thing and each of the individual product owners is then in charge to deliver one set of um, goal for the overall EPIC. The product owner of the EPIC also becomes the responsibility to um, address impediments, for example, and also to make sure that the progress on each of the EPICs is made transparent to the overall company. So with each sprint, he's probably burning down something like that. So he's something like a release backlog in points. And once the epic is done, they update the um, value estimate there as well. So how does this work when you work with different teams on the same product, and especially in the hardcore world? This is when um, the thought process from Spotify comes in. Spotify itself uh, has different items on their website and on their different clients like uh, the news and the playlist behavior, the playback behavior, the mobile devices and so on. And for each of the modules there are standard interfaces and uh, they overall integrate together um, individually. So each of the teams can release one of their modules and integrate it with the rest of it. And the same thing um, is something you'd like to apply for hardware there as well. So how does this work? How can we make this work? This is uh, something from Wikispeed. Wikispeed itself has eight different modules. There are integration points between each of the modules. One problem with hardware is that um, the interfaces are 
um, not quite that changeable. So when you work with hardware, you usually come up with a broader interface so you're able to uh, get a new wire in there if later on in the process you find out you need one. So for example, if uh, you have the suspension model and the pedal plate and uh, the interior model and you find out that you need a new wire through these different things because you want to see, for example, the uh, gas pressure in the tires, then you need to have a hole somewhere in that interface between the suspension model and the interior model so that you are able to uh, get that wire through. And that's where you end up probably with a broader interface in the beginning so that you can bring in new changes afterwards. Um, for modularity to work, that's quite easy in software where you have uh, software modules and integrating them is usually done with the continuous integration server or something like that. Uh, in hardware, it's a bit more problematic to keep something similar. So on the top left, you see a CPU socket and uh, you can replace that in order um, to come up with hot swapping modules where you can develop one of each of the patines in, on their own as long as you keep um, to the initial interface so that you can hot swap out a new version of each of the individual models. I think this is actually something from Wikispeed that they use there. Uh, independence between models becomes important, though you have the same problem in software as well. It's not quite easy to achieve that, but that's where agile architecture comes in. And um, yeah, that's sort of the end point for this section. So let's see, any more free questions on this? Yeah, no, I went back from presentation mode. Seem to be a couple of questions on the last section. <clears throat> so far, the only point I see you telling is let's produce more cores. We can money more often. Uh, I would like to postpone that a bit to um, the end of the presentation maybe to go into more details. You know, there's a question from Daniel. How long is one sprint for the plane development? If I think back correctly, I think they're on one week sprints or one month sprints. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but it's quite short when it comes to hardware development. Are there any further questions? Then just says thanks. All right. So let's continue. Production lines. So I think this is from Boeing. This is a picture from the production line in the Boeing process from the 737, if I recall correctly, or no, this is certainly the 747, estimating its size. And so one problem you have is in, in software you just copy some modules over and then integrate them together and then have some integration tests done and that's it. In order to be able to use the same flexibility that you have in the software world with new production techniques like integrating a new library, that's sort of hard to do in the uh, hardware world because you have the production line set up and uh, changing that line is usually not that easily done. So that's me at Boeing. Uh, I went to one of the most, the biggest um, buildings when it comes to square foot in the world, I think. Uh, well, it sort of depends. Um, the Gigafactory from Tesla, I think, is currently a bit larger. <coughs> uh, so I went to, to the building where the 73, no, the 747, the 777 and the 787 was produced and this is me just outside the building because obviously you can't take pictures inside there. And so coming back to, to how production lines usually work, um, quite from the Ford area there's this idea of having a sequential line where you have one step being done at the time and continuing through. 
uh, this is sort of um, changed recently and there are right now more and more feeder lines that uh, work on the assemblies on the current um, product that is being built and um, from time to time different specialists come in to install for example the chairs and the cockpit and so on. And one problem with the sequential line is that um, whenever there's a problem with one particular start, step, you need to hold the line, that's what Toyota did in the sort of 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s when Taichi Ono took there, so you stop the line, so the whole production plan comes to a stop. Then you fix the problem and once you fix the problem you can continue on. That gives you some sort of interruption, especially if you have um, different steps being taken and uh, different variations in the steps being taken. For example, in the plane industry, usually there's some final painting being printed on in the factory itself and there are easy uh, logos being applied on the plane and there are more customary logos applied on the planes itself and um, these might take longer and you don't want to, to stop the whole line just because the plane in front of you isn't finished yet. So that's where the concept of feeder lines come in. How could you use that in order to, to be able to, to overcome some of the drawbacks such sequential lines have? So here's a traditional lean one-piece flow system. Um, production plans usually are pretty good in uh, lean development already. Usually that works like uh, you have a couple of stars coming in through trucks on the upper left. Then you have different lean cells where different pieces of the product are being built and um, the whole product ships through the whole um, production line. And in the end, there's still some testing that needs to be done, for example, like a flight test where, um, for example, you take off the plane after it's been finished, then you need to emergency land it so that uh, even the tires catch on on, uh, on fire so that you can see that the automatic fire extinguishers that are part of the landing um, gears are taking over control to, to uh, reduce the heat and so on. So after that uh, testing, you can deliver that if you've done that. So what you can see here is that there are a couple of things where star comes in. So uh, on, the lower left, uh, on the upper left, there's some stock in terms of pieces that come in that you need to assemble. Um, there's some stock of finished planes before testing takes place and there's some kind of stock before delivery uh, in the end. And probably each of the arrows in between has also some uh, stock cabling. And if you consider planes, uh, it's terrible to have many of them in stock because they're quite uh, taking a lot of space on your uh, parking lot or whatever you have. So how could you make more use of, um, how's it called, how could you make more use of feeder lines? So the idea is to have a stock back plane where trucks come in and still deliver um, pieces for your overall product. Then you have various scrum teams working on the plane, integrating it with all the other stuff, and then you have a stock from plane where you deliver out the work in the end. But um, you would go away from um, a whole sequential production line, but the scrum teams coming to the um, sort of unfinished product when they have something to do there and then move on to the next plane in inside that, All right? All right. That concludes the third section. Do we have any more questions? Oh, there are a couple of questions. So let's take three and then look in the end on that. From my point of view, hardware modules cannot be developed completely independently. It's harder to do in uh, in the hardware world. Um, so one thing that Wikispeed did was um, to, to reach 100 miles per gallon car um, 
was to well, this stems from the Spotify uh, thinking. So each individual Scrum team has a goal, like in the lean startup sense. So, for example, for the engine model, there would be a derived goal from the overall epic to have a 100 miles per gallon car to have an engine that is uh, full effective to the degree needed to reach that 100 miles per gallon, for example. And um, they can reach that sort of independently from the suspension model, from the brakes and so on. <clears throat> but still, whenever there's not enough independence, uh, the integration part is quite, uh, is quite important. Because if you don't have the room to get a new wire there to reach that thing, um, it's hard to achieve that. Helen, by the way, Apple and others deliver new phones every year. There's a lot more iterations left to the doomsday. And thanks to that model and marketing hype, the quality of devices went down. The battery typically just dies after a year of normal use. So where's the benefit to customers except being, woo, I'm using the latest and greatest. So, um, well, I think Apple is a bit special in that. Um, one problem is with the battery dying, um, I would like to have something like a replaceable batteries so that you can uh, replace, for example, on the iPhone, the battery. Whenever a new battery pack comes in, then you can just use that and it's more, um, more effective, more efficient on, on power consumption, for example. Um, but you're right. <coughs> And thanks to the model and marketing hype, the quality of devices went down. But I can't say too much about Apple there internally. Um, I think they're usually building um, new devices in their own plant to keep them separate from uh, the other development going on. And from time to time, they use new innovations there because they are independent from the production line. For example, um, let's consider the first iPhone. So Steve Jobs could have said, all right, we bring out an iPhone, but that was sort of uh, conflicting with the iPod market there. So one problem they solved by sending them to a new completely office uh, to develop the iPhone is to get rid of the tension between the existing products like the iPod and developing a new iPhone. And um, because eventually the iPhone uh, could take away lots of market users for the iPod and maybe become, have the iPod become obsolete in the end. And uh, looking at today's world, I think this sort of is what happened. You want to have the freedom without the tension from the remaining um, from the remaining company if you develop something new so like that <clears throat> all right another one from Daniel especially when considering integration of electrical and mechanical parts in one product I think this is in addition to the independence so um, if you're integrating electrical and mechanical parts in one product so let me go back to this slide here. So um, there are ways that you can achieve uh, sort of independence as long as you have a stable interface and uh, you agree on that upfront. It's easy to change something in that model in order to come up with improvements. Right? Okay, let's head to the final section, suppliers. So when it comes to suppliers, and after that, we'll take a look on the remaining questions. So uh, it's very widespread in the hardware world that you have supplier management. Uh, not all pieces are shipped um, by the vendors themselves, but uh, they usually have some supplier management happening there. Uh, when I was working with the surgery desk, we had uh, one interface to supplier management integrated into the Scrum team there as well to be able to um, see 
what kind of prices do we get for this on that part once we enter final production line and so on. And um, one interesting thing during the sprint reviews there was that they had a uh, cost estimate for producing one piece of the desk and uh, that estimate was updated with every new supplier contract and there was special attention during uh, sprint review for what are our actual um, production costs at this time. So this is sort of um, unused in the software world, so how, how much does it cost to run such piece of product is usually a fixed cost and in the hardware world, especially if you have a couple of suppliers you work with, that becomes more complex, at least complicated, I would say. Uh, here's something from Tesla. This is from the book uh, about Elon Musk, his uh, biography. So what Elon Musk does is um, whenever he deals with suppliers, he takes um, the raw material costs, the atoms from which the product is made, like uh, circuitry or something like that, and for each aluminium, copper, or whatever you have, for each of the material um, you get something like the weight. Then you go to the London Stock Exchange, at least that's what Elon is doing, and uh, look up how much does it cost for that material that we need um, on the free market. With the supplier cost estimate and the raw costs of the material, he knows how inefficient um, the supplier is working. So the delta between material cost and sale price is the cost of manufacturer plus profit margin. So um, when you have different suppliers and usually you get cost estimates from three or five or something like that in order to make a decision which one to take, you have a better basis to um, check which supply is working better or more efficient in order to, to see if you just compare it to the raw material price so that you know all right this production that and that much right that's what Elon is doing and uh, listening to the biography from Elon Musk it's quite interesting that uh, I think he's in some terms in a different industry where he's driven more by innovation than trying to bring Silicon Valley knowledge to things like uh, SpaceX and Tesla. So um, for the first SpaceX um, test flight, the real flight, uh, they figured that they had a supplier in China which was producing uh, some piece of it for them or willing to do that. Um, they had the Vandenberg Air Brace, uh, somewhere in the Caribbean and they figured in order to get those pieces from China to Vandenberg would mean not only the customs that you need to clear and so on, but the problem was that uh, the shipping usually lasted six weeks or so to get the parts from China by a ship to a Vandenberg airport base so that they can then integrate them and see whether it's working fine or not. When going for, in 2008, for the first test flight, uh, SpaceX was uh, well, a bit drawn back, I think is um, an okayish term. The problem was that they had close to no money in the bank and no further capitalists willing to, to give them some more money. And what they did was um, they figured that six weeks of just shipping would be a cost too high in time. So that's when uh, they started to insource um, all the, not, not all, but especially that part. They figured out, all right, we can build this on our own because then we have the advantage that we can iterate faster in order to be able to, to um, have the first successful test flight there with um, the Falcon rocket. And uh, th this is sort of a pattern that uh, 
goes through not only SpaceX but Tesla. So, uh, for example, the Gigafactory was probably just built for that one purpose because they figured there are not enough uh, lithium-ion batteries available on the market. So they could have asked someone to produce them for that, but they said, all right, no, we're building a Gigafactory there in order to be able to serve the mass market in the end. And um, probably because they became also alert of the inefficiencies that some of the major vendors there have. Right. Um, here's the probably most successful um, story that Scrum Inc. shares on, from one of their customers. And uh, that team went to 30, 30 times, 13 times, not 30, 13 times the velocity they had initially. And I think this is from John Deere. So you can see the PSI sprint one, two, three. Um, then there's a cut where um, the story points seem to skyrocket. That's when the team became stable because before that the team was pretty unstable. After that, three more sprints and then they started to track all the work they were doing in the sprint backlog. Of course, it's sort of just, um, they were doing it anyway, but then they started to track it. And uh, you can see the dramatic impact it had on PSI 3 uh, Sprint 1 to PSI 3 Sprint 2, where the team became unstable again. So it went down from 106, 165 story points for that sprint to 137 story points for that sprint. And um, eventually they convinced that to go over that. That leads to second to last slide. So 11 ways Scrum Inc. lists to, to double your velocity. So stable teams, yesterday's weather, finish early. Uh, that gives you a high moral. Dedicated teams, daily Scrum, interrupt buffer, small teams, ready backlog, fixed bugs within a day, T-shaped people, all testing completed inside the sprint and co-location. Note that each of these 11 ways to double your velocity not necessarily has something to do with software, but can be applied to half your teams there as well. All right. I'm not 100% on the 2048 times better though, but uh, well, if you do the math, doubling your velocity on each of these 11 ways, well, might be. That's sort of all for me for the time. And I think, Derek, shall we do questions first? Yeah, sure. Um, if you have any more questions for Marcus that you haven't already typed in, um, please do so now. And just while you're, you're typing your questions there, I have one or two more slides that I'd like to go through myself here. So let me just open my, my screen and All right. you should see my screen here now. Okay, so we have some more webinars taking place this week and our next webinar takes place tomorrow with uh, Dirk Jan de Groot and Jan Yap Kennegetter and they will be talking to you about survival techniques for testers beyond the T-shaped tester. Uh, this was a talk they had done at Eurostar last year. It was quite popular. So um, if you're available, uh, we'd love for you to come along. We also have a webinar on Wednesday with Irfan Ahmed and Rajini Padmanaban. And they'll be looking at understanding linguistic testing end to end. And this is a topic that they'll be presenting at the Eurostar conference 2016. So this will give you a little insight as to what you can expect from the conference. And uh, right now as well, we have our early bird offer where you can get a 10% discount on your conference ticket. Okay, um, let's see, do we have any more questions there, Marcus? Anything come in? There was at least one I postponed. And I think there are two additional, I think it looks more like a comment than a question. So let me start with the one I postponed, maybe. I think there's another question on that. So far, the only point I see you telling is let's produce more because we can money more often. 
and the same from Helen. And the price is getting cheaper for some forms. So this consumerism either devalues the currency through inflation or separates rich from poor. I don't see any benefit for humanity in delivering faster and faster. Um, so how do I put it? In general terms, um, well, the thing is, why are you using Scrum in the software world? So mostly you're doing that in order to be able to get something out the door quickly in order to see, is it valuable? How valuable is it? And to validate that and get early feedback that you can incorporate in order to be able to deliver a refined version of whatever you have delivered. I'm not sure you can't apply that to hardware. I think you can. Um, you just need to, to think in similar ways. So take the sub ripen. You deliver it every six months, then get feedback and bring up in six months a new version of it so that you are able to deliver a refined version, a better version than you had before. Uh, that not necessarily just um, is addressed to the point that you want to have more money getting out of the door or something like that, but that you want to validate how useful is it really to a customer and how can we make it more useful in terms for the, um, the main problem I said along in the beginning. Um, you would probably put something like a value statement on your CO2 um, production there or something like that in order to see is is it really helping with uh, the climate change there. Bring it out and uh, then have a refined version of it. You can probably just do that if you are, are able to have something installed like all plugable modules or something like that. And then you can even ship a new part to your existing customers or trial it out, a new part, at an existing customer place as long as you value the stable interface that you set up before. So that probably leads to not only making more money, but in the long run to um, better CO2 and coal and, and, and uh, oil and, 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 and um, depletions there, right? Oh, there's a new one. Uh, Dendo had another thing, for example, a potential collision between mechanical and elite components can have a big impact on PCB designs again. Um, I haven't worked too much with PCBs, so I'm not sure yet. Um, it probably can have, but um, on the other hand, if I take a look at modern computers, there are hot plugable um, interfaces for things like hard drives and so on. It, I think it's just a matter of uh, we probably haven't found the way to do that. And of course it's sort of a trade-off uh, in some industries where you want to go for an embedded thing, then you have limited space and uh, making the interface the broader is uh, a decision of trade-off, I would say. right? So, are you suggesting a subscription model for hardware? Um, I'm not sure. Um, well, coming from Germany, where we have a large automotive industry, uh, I can see some of its limitations right now, especially when uh, currently Tesla tries to get into that market there. What Tesla did from right from the start in a good fashion is um, you get over the air updates overnight for your car once it's safe to do that, to upgrade that. I'm wondering uh, why haven't I seen that in any other um, vendor's car yet. So what they quite interestingly did is you don't need a subscription model necessarily for all the hardware involved there but you get software updates every once in a while and by that you are able to get new functionality in the morning just by updating it uh, over some SIM card or your 
Wi-Fi at home. So um, I think there are ways to be able to um, get something close to a subscription model for hardware. Question is, why haven't we thought about that one as of now? Right. All right. It seems I'm at the end of the questions. Okay. I um, I think we'll we'll wrap it up at that today, Marcus. And thank you very much for 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 taking your time out today to do this presentation. And thank you to all of our attendees today and all of your questions. This webinar is being recorded and it'll be available over on Test Huddle very shortly. So we, we hope you can make it to the other webinars we have this week. And um, that's it from us. Um, thank you all and take care. Take care. Bye-bye.